On this semester, we already had one speaker earlier here today, and we have two more coming, so be on the lookout for that. Join our Facebook group if you're not already part of it, so you have updates on all of our events. After the lecture, you're welcome to come up and get free literature. Throughout the lecture, we might be giving away some fun books that are not over there. Um, so let's, I guess we'll just get started. Um, Dr. Scott Bullier is the director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center of Political Economy at Troy University and the Adams Vivi Chair of Free Enterprise. He got his PhD in economics from George Mason University. <coughs> his research focuses on development of issues and policy. So please help me welcome Dr. Scott Bullier. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I know some of you are headed right up to Troy uh, tomorrow for a weekend conference that we're hosting, and uh, I look forward to seeing those of you who are coming up uh, at that event. I feel like I should just take a carload of you with me tonight, uh, since the event begins tomorrow anyway, um, and you can just hang out in the in the Johnson Center tonight or something, uh, and at least have to drive out of the way. Uh, it's really great to be here at Florida State. Uh, visiting Florida State is particularly special for me because the namesake of our center, uh, Manley Johnson, is actually a graduate of the Florida State Economics Program. He was here uh, back in the 1970s. His undergraduate is from Troy University, uh, and he wanted to give some money back to Troy to start this center um, that I direct. But he did his graduate work here and has been very good to Florida State University as well. So he's someone who's helping a lot of you all out uh, behind the scenes and someone very important uh, in the free enterprise movement. Uh, I direct a center and do a lot of um, work day in, day out as an administrator of the center and to chair of uh, the economics program. I don't get to do as much of this as I'd like to be just out talking to students about some of the research that we're doing. Uh, so it's really fun and exciting to get on the road and talk to other students uh, about what we're doing in some of our core uh, focus areas as center scholars. I have uh, four other economists who do work related to economic freedom and how economic freedom interacts with human capabilities, uh, how free markets are making us all better off, and what some of the tensions are between freedom and a lot of other things that we worry about. I have four back in Troy who I work with day in, day out, and two more who I'm hiring uh, and who will be on board in, uh, in August of 2013. So if you haven't heard about this center yet and you're in the least bit interested in free enterprise, it's one of the uh, real exciting regional centers uh, in the southeast. And we're hoping to make Troy a really awesome university and the center something that's um, part of the national conversation about freedom and, uh, and government. Uh, so this brings me to the presentation I'm going to give you all tonight. I intend to talk for about 40 minutes or so, uh, and then hopefully have some time for questions. One of the things that our center does is focus on state policy issues. Uh, we do things uh, related to tornado recovery. So if you all have paid any attention to the state of Alabama, where Troy is located, uh, we've gotten hit with many tornadoes uh, in the last several years. The Tuscaloosa tornadoes of 2011 were particularly devastating uh, and costly to the state. So I have a couple of economists back at Troy who do work on how you should respond to um, tornadoes when they hit. Okay, and There are many things that you could do as a city after a tornado hits. One of the findings that they've produced is that maybe the best approach is to not overregulate after a tornado. Okay, So let people try to come back to the area, let people try to rebuild, and not micromanage a recovery. Okay, So they, they do work in this area on tornado recovery. Uh, I do some work on uh, pension reform. <clears throat> but another area where a colleague of mine, Dan Smith, and I have done some work is on immigration. Strange issue to be picking up. Uh, in Alabama, uh, immigration. You know, like, why are we worried about immigration in Alabama? We wouldn't be, uh, except lawmakers were really worried about immigration in Alabama, and we decided to um, take a stand and say some things that weren't popular, uh, but we felt needed to be said. In fact, as I've said, I'm a free enterpriser. I'm usually criticized for being a right-wing kook. Okay, like, oh, he's a right-wing defender of capitalism. All right, and that's a standard attack. Until um, I got into this immigration debate, which started in 2011, uh, I was called a Marxist, a liberal egghead who um, should no longer be at a university. We should be ashamed of having this professor in a conservative state like Alabama. And I was just painted as a commie pinko, essentially. So uh, really kind of odd to be doing immigration work and be 
called the Kami, um, but it's uh, because people don't understand this issue. And my hope tonight is to just give you some of the basics that we've been arguing uh, as economists in the state of Alabama about immigration and give you some background as to why it's such a messed up issue in our state. Uh, so let's get into this a little bit. I, uh, I rely on pictures to help me uh, at times remember what it is I'm going to say. I think pictures also are uh, somewhat provocative. This is uh, a picture of one of the largest groups of immigrants coming into the country ever uh, in the United States at one time. Okay, this is back in the heyday of immigration. Has anyone visited Ellis Island before? Uh, been to Manhattan and visited it? It's worth spending half a day at, uh, checking out and seeing how maybe your ancestors came to America. Okay? Uh, on this boat, there are people probably from Ireland, uh, from Poland, from Lithuania. You can guess, a lot of uh, European countries uh, who are all coming over here for a chance. And they came with relative ease to America. They actually were able to get off on Ellis Island. They had to pass some pretty minimal fitness tests, okay? So you couldn't come to the country and be really, really sick. You couldn't be really, really disabled, all right? Uh, you had to be able to answer a few questions from the immigration officer, but then you were able to get passed through, and usually where you went first was Manhattan, and there were actually different neighborhoods in Manhattan that now basically have sky rises, and we call them Little Italy, and we call them Chinatown, but back in the day, these were different areas uh, that were homes to immigrants, okay? Uh, and then they spread out throughout the United States in a period that lasted up until about 1914. There was a heyday of free trade in America. It was a heyday of uh, pretty open immigration uh, during this time. This is what I think of when, uh, when I think of an immigrant. It's this period, okay? Uh, this is what people probably think of more today. Um, this is a, a picture of um, a Mexican man trying to cross the U.S. border at Tijuana. Uh, all of those crosses represent people who didn't make it, okay? Who tried to cross and either died in the desert, okay, um, died when getting picked up, uh, got completely lost, okay, and had no success at crossing the border. And you can see from this that uh, the crosses go down as far as the eye can see uh, along the wall. This is, I think, uh, capturing in one slide what people think is the immigration problem in America today, all right? You have a lot of people, mainly from Latin America, that want to get into this country. We have to do something to keep them out. This is probably what inspired Arizona's pretty harsh uh, immigration law. Uh, it's probably what's inspiring a lot of state policies along the border with Mexico. This is the problem in a nutshell. What are we going to do with this guy if he gets into our country? So the argument goes, okay? Uh, lots of focus on it along the Mexican border. But now in 2011, we have Alabama entering the fray and saying, we have an immigration problem too, okay? Alabama, not along the Mexican border, a state that's home mainly to Alabamians, okay? Just for trivia, to give you a, a sense of how um, big this problem is, does anyone want to take a guess at what the estimate was in 2011 as to how many uh, illegal immigrants we might have had in the state of Alabama? Population of Alabama is maybe about five million. Anyone want to take a guess for a book <laughs> uh, as to how many illegal immigrants there might have been? Remember, they're illegal, so it's hard to count. How many illegal immigrants? 250,000. Uh, a little lower. 100,000. Good, yeah, 100,000 on the dot. That's the estimate, is that there were 100,000 illegal immigrants. Okay, so let's put this problem in perspective. 100,000 illegal immigrants out of a population of 5 million and our lawmakers in 2011 moved ahead with legislation that passed the stiffest immigration bill in the country. Arizona having the stiffest immigration bill in the country kind of makes sense, at least like politically. You're right there along the border, you need to be tough on immigration if you're a policymaker. Alabama's legislators in 2011 said, let's one up Arizona and pass a really intense immigration bill. An immigration bill that's so intense that say if you're a landlord to an illegal immigrant, you could be held responsible for housing an illegal immigrant, okay? That's pretty intense, all right? Uh, and we probably passed that in our state in 2011. This is what inspired me to get interested in this issue. Uh, most people thought it was a really good policy. In fact, this lawmaker I'm gonna talk about in a minute said it's the very best bill Alabama has ever passed. It's gonna be a job creator. 
It's going gonna, it's gonna to create lots and lots of jobs. It's going to be stimulus for the economy, okay? And it's the best bill Alabama has ever passed. Now think about Alabama's history a little bit, all right? We've had some civil rights issues in the state of Alabama that have been kind of bad. I'm sure there's been some legislation related to that that was pretty good that was passed. But this is the best thing that we've ever done. Best thing since sliced bread, okay? And my colleague Dan Smith and I said, you know, we really need to weigh in on this because the perspective that immigration could possibly have some benefits just wasn't being argued. There were a few churches that were arguing and saying, um, this is just inhumane, okay? But for the most part, there wasn't uh, a strong argument against it being made, and we uh, weighed in and said, uh, the economics of this are pretty clear, and that immigration is a benefit. And we'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, first, this is um, a, a green dude, okay? And uh, uh, this is how people in Alabama talk about um, the immigration problem, not people, uh, just one person who I want to single out and say is uh, pretty bad. Uh, the guy who um, was one of the major sponsors of the immigration bill, someone named Scott Beeson, he's a uh, state lawmaker. I've tried to um, publicly debate him. I have a television show back in Troy, I've invited him on. I feel like Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper can never get the guy on he wants, but he spends five minutes saying, we invited him and he didn't return our calls, okay? Same thing with this guy. Um, he refuses to publicly call illegal immigrants illegal immigrants and deliberately calls them aliens, okay? So in his eyes, I think he actually sees little green people as the problem. And uh, uh, it's very frustrating. If you look up uh, some of the other things that he said, uh, I'll leave it to you um, to look this guy up, but he's, he's something else. His name's Scott Wiesa. Um, he, uh, he's just had gap after gap that uh, people in other states would say is just completely inappropriate uh, and phrases that shouldn't be uttered, but he utters them, including calling uh, illegal immigrants aliens. Um, he sponsored the legislation, it passed easily, it was very popular, and we're going to talk about some of the consequences of it in, uh, in a little bit. Let's get to uh, where I want to go uh, with this, though. So, Starting points, these all should be um, non-debatable, non-controversial. Uh, first, an immigrant, it's a person who leaves one country to settle permanently in another. Um, we're usually talking about immigrants and labor that they provide, that's often why they come to another country, uh, and that's just to work, okay? Trade, uh, something that's voluntary and usually involves goods, services, capital, or labor. I'm in a free exchange tonight with Florida State University. I'm trading with Florida State tonight, okay? I'm down here, drove down from Troy, Alabama this afternoon. Lots of farm fields between here and, uh, and Troy. Uh, I came voluntarily because I expected the benefits of being here to exceed the costs. That's how labor relationships work. The laborer expects benefits greater than the cost, and so does the person on the other end paying the money. Uh, that's trade. And there's something that we're going to argue throughout uh, this presentation. I know you all have Ben Powell here um, just a few weeks ago talking about sweatshops. I'm guessing, I've seen his talk uh, before, and I'm guessing he was hanging his argument to a significant, significant extent on something that we call revealed preference theory. All right? How do you make the case for sweatshops? You say that people are voluntarily entering exchanges, and they're choosing to work at a sweatshop over their next best alternative. Okay? Similar things going on when it comes to immigration. People are choosing and voting with their feet to get out of one really oppressive country into an opportunity that's a little bit better, okay? So those are the, hopefully the non-controversial starting points, especially since you've seen uh, Ben Powell's presentation already. Uh, I like to frame pretty much anything I'm thinking about uh, in relation to Adam Smith. What would Adam Smith, Smith have thought about it? Uh, the great father of economics. Uh, Adam Smith would have been a pretty big fan of immigration and uh, openness. He was focused much more on trade, uh, but here's something he says about trade. If books can be had much cheaper from Ireland, is not this an advantage, not to English books, booksellers indeed, but to English readers and to learning? In transactions of trade, it is not like gaming. What one party gains, the other must necessarily lose. The gain to each may be equal, if A had more corn than he could consume, but wants cattle, and B has more cattle, but wants corn, 
and exchanges a gain to each, hereby the common stock of comforts in life is increased. In a nutshell, free trade increases the wealth of nations. Okay, that's all he's saying there with corn and cattle and a lot of other stuff. And if you block those transactions, if you block someone being able to get a <coughs> cheap book from Ireland, you're hampering, you're hampering uh, the comforts of life for that person. Okay? I think that if, uh, if Smith were alive today, he would just extend it. And it's a very simple extension to say that labor, okay, when you're employing more inexpensive labor, even if it's coming from a person who's working abroad, doing so is actually a benefit that's raising the comfort of life for humanity. Here's an example that you all would say um, makes pretty good sense, I think. Uh, I live in Troy. I live on a one acre lot in Troy. One acre, if you don't know, is a lot of land. And my entire one acre is mowable land. It requires mowing. I have this John Deere tractor that, it, for about the first three months, was really, really cool. Like, wow, I've got this green John Deere tractor. Isn't this going to be fun to ride around? Okay? And for the first three months, riding the John Deere tractor was like the greatest thing in my life. Like, wow, I feel like such a country boy. Okay? And I've never had a tractor before. Um, well, now I'm two and a half years into having this John Deere tractor. The one acre of grass hasn't gone anywhere, but my time is really valuable, and I hate to be on the John Deere tractor. I just, just I, I can't stand it, all right? You're out there just riding the tractor, and it's tedious. You just go back and forth, waiting for the grass to cut. And there are a few things that remind you of how boring certain activities can be than just mowing your lawn every seven to 10 days, which is when, how often you need to do it when it's raining like it's bad and it's a little warmer than it is now. So I have done something that many of you who've had some basic econ would advise a person to do. I've outsourced it, okay? I've outsourced it to a guy named Chris, okay? Chris cuts my lawn. Anyone want to take a guess what one acre of mowing costs? $60. 75 Okay, so I pay him 75 bucks, all right? 75 bucks every seven to 10 days. I should have given the book away on that question. I'll get this other book given away here. Uh, so $75 every seven to 10 days to Chris. Now let's just imagine uh, that I go down the road to Lowe's and I find someone there who speaks just a little bit of Spanish, just enough to say, I saw your yard, I, I wish I could talk Spanish, all right? I saw your yard, I saw your one acre, I can mow your grass more cheaply. I know how to drive your tractor. I'll show up and cut it for more inexpensive prices than 75. Let's say he says he'll do it for 25. I think Adam Smith would tell us what to do in that case, all right? Same quality, okay? He'll cut the lawn exactly the same as Chris. It's, after all, just mowing grass, okay? It's nothing really fancy. There's not much to it. Stay on the tractor, don't fall off, okay? And just keep on cutting. Enjoy the slow hum of the John Deere. Uh, if I can get that person to do it for 25, but I know nothing about where he's from, okay, what his background is, whether he's American, whether he's foreign, whether he's legal or illegal, I feel like uh, it sure makes financial sense for me to pay the $25. Disemploy Chris, okay, Chris is fired, no more, no more Chris, bless his heart, and hire the gentleman who's willing to do it for $25, okay? Now, I probably wouldn't be able to ever um, secure a Supreme Court nomination if I do this, all right? In fact, if I employ Chris, okay, who's an American born in Alabama, if I just contract and pay him cash, I probably am not gonna get a Supreme Court nomination either, all right? But if I hire the illegal, immigrant to cut my grass, I'm really, really not going to get the Supreme Court nomination. There's like just a categorical difference between paying cash to one person versus the other. In terms of my well-being, though, I think it's pretty darn clear what I ought to do. I ought to hire the person for $25. I keep $50, I can go out to dinner with my wife afterwards at the end of the day, okay? That's a big gain. It's exactly like what Smith's talking about here with hiring, or with, with buying the cheaper books from Ireland, okay? It's just a logical extension of a free trade argument. The person who I employ for 25 gains from it, and how do we know that he's gained from it? He accepted it. Well. He accepted it, back to Ben Powell's stock. 
He accepted it. He accepted the 25 bucks and said, this is making me better. That's revealed preference theory, but once again. So one argument that you hear against illegal immigration is that we're exploiting illegal immigrants. And this just doesn't make any sense, okay? If they're willingly entering these exchanges, okay? If illegal immigrants want to work for $25 and I want to contract with them for 25, let it happen, okay? That's free exchange, as I understand it. And if we allow lots and lots of these exchanges to happen, I think the world could potentially be a much better place. Adam Smith would think that too, although we're not sure. We don't have a lot of textual evidence on the issue of immigration from him. Okay, let's get to a few things that people say in response to this idea that immigration could be a benefit, okay? The idea that uh, immigration is on net um, a force for good uh, is the argument that I'm going to make throughout this evening. There are a number of attacks to that basic idea. And how am I making the argument that it's good? Re-exchange, voluntary transactions that must be win-win or we wouldn't enter them. Okay, a very basic argument. Here are some of the things that people say, and these are in order of um, kind of how you hear them. This is probably the one that you hear most, at least in Alabama, uh, this was the big one. Remember, the, the lawmaker Scott Beeson was saying, best bill that we've ever passed, this is going to be a job creator. HB 56 was the name of the bill. This is going to be a really big engine for job creation in the state. Uh, what was he thinking? Well, he was thinking that immigrants take away jobs and depress wages. Um, okay, I think he's dead wrong empirically on that. Okay, and it just doesn't pass the test of like basic logic or history either, okay? So if he believes that, um, one thing that he's doing is confusing the seen versus the unseen. Let's go back to the example I just gave you. What do you all see if I fire Chris and hire someone else for $25? The major visible effect is that Chris is now out of work. Okay? And the illegal immigrant that I hired for $25 almost doesn't get counted. You hired an illegal, you took a job from an American. You all probably have heard this in the immigration debate. An, an American lost his job for the sake of an illegal being hired. So what you see is a lost job. What you miss out on quite often, if you're, not, if you're a non-economist, what you miss out on is the fact that there's value that's been created. I just got my grass mowed for 25 bucks instead of 75. That's $50 extra that's gonna go somewhere. Maybe it goes into my daughter's retirement account. Maybe it's for a meal with my wife. Maybe it's to drive to Tallahassee just for the heck of it. Now I have gas money. Somewhere there's value created by that savings. But people who focus on like just the very first layer of the immigration debate say, an American lost their job, an immigrant got it, that's worse for America. That's a really shaky argument, okay? Economics is about thinking beyond stage one. That's stage one thinking, just thinking about the first uh, order effect, okay? Uh, if you believe that immigrants take away jobs and depress wages, you should also be an opponent of women entering the labor force, and you should also be an, a, an opponent of reproduction, okay? Seriously. Think about what happened after, uh, during World War II, and then afterwards, as women began to enter the labor force. What were women in the labor force for men? Competition. competition. Lots of competition, okay? If you're a man, you should really have resisted this and not been a fan of it. In fact, millions of women have entered the labor force and the United States has grown thanks to that, okay? In large part because of that. To block that for the sake of men would actually leave the United States right now in 2012 probably like a 1980 country. Okay? If we had just deliberately blocked women from working. So think about what we're doing when we deliberately block illegal immigrants from coming here. Probably something in terms of productivity that's pretty harmful. You all, okay, I, I won't go all the way down to I won't go all the way down to the level of babies, but you all are basically the babies that will one day be competing for my job. Okay? I don't want any of you to succeed. Okay, because I don't want competition. We should all say no more graduate education in economics. None of you, okay? Go away, because you're competing with Bollier. Think about what would happen. What a sad sob story there would be if I lose my job. I would go on the evening news, I would manipulate the news to my heart's content. Remember, I have a television show. I'm gonna go on there and cry and say, 
One of these graduate students who I met took my job. Okay? I will cry. I swear to God. <laughs> I'll cry. Um, you all would say this is absurd. We should have competition in the market for economists. After all, my skills in economics, they're, they're slipping fast. They're slipping as we move along tonight, in fact, okay? Um, I'm depreciating, I'm like a refrigerator. I'm depreciating real slowly, and one day I'm gonna stop working when it comes to producing economics. I should have some competition that's helping keep the fridge going, okay? Uh, but we could have laws that just protect people. And in fact, we have a whole bunch of laws that protect people. <coughs> and keep competition out of different uh, markets. So women and babies um, should be viewed as really bad if you think through the logic of being against immigration. Economists actually have looked at this more systematically. Um, a guy a, a name, with the last name of Boros has done a number of studies, and he's tortured the data and looked at it and tried to cut it every which way. And if anything, there's a very small statistical effect, okay, on high school graduates and high school dropouts. That's the only part of the spectrum where we see a major negative effect on immigration. That effect is statistically significant, but very, very small in magnitude. And he really struggles to get it, okay? And he's someone who's looking for it, essentially. He's out there looking for the result, and he's saying, it's really hard to find, okay? So if you um, are a student of econometrics, that's bad when you're looking for it, and it's still hard to find, okay? Uh, so in the, in the economics literature, it's hard to make this case that they're taking jobs away and depressing wages. If they are, it's very, very slight, all right? And I'm not sure that, uh, that immigrants are. Why? Because many of the jobs that they're wanting are ones that we simply do not want to supply, we being Americans, okay? Here's uh, an example from Alabama, which inspired uh, some of this research. On one of our uh, projects, Dan Smith and I actually have a tomato farmer as a co-author, which is really kind of a weird um, relationship to have a tomato farmer as a co-author, but he supplied us with a whole bunch of data on, uh, on what happened after the immigration law was passed. Very interesting little side story. He was strongly in favor of the immigration bill, and then as soon as it passed, he realized he lost all of his labor, and he said, whoops, uh, I really didn't like that bill. Okay, and got really mad about the fact that we passed this bill. Uh, this is a picture of tomatoes on the ground. Tomatoes rotting. It's a picture from Alabama. Um, what's unique about it is this is not how things should be. Tomatoes shouldn't be this far along. I don't know if any of you grow your own tomatoes. Probably not. You're college students, okay? But if you've ever grown tomatoes, you know to pick them just as they're turning a little bit red, and then they'll ripen up. Did anyone like come from families with gardens, you wait until they're just starting to ripen, they're mostly green and just a little bit like pink and red. These are pure red tomatoes that are rotting. And this is what happened in the winter of 2011 in Alabama. It sounds like a very minor event, but in fact we actually had a lot of restaurants that didn't have tomatoes because they were in contracts with Alabama suppliers. The Alabama tomato harvest was really, really low. Why was it low? You all know the answer probably. An immigration bill <coughs> passed, okay, HB 56 passed. Our 100,000 or so illegal immigrants said, I've got to get the heck out of here in a hurry, okay? So it was a hit to a number of restaurants, of course. It was a hit to our housing market to lose all of these illegal immigrants, but it was a particularly harsh hit to our tomato market because there was no one there to pick the tomatoes. Near the end of this presentation, I'm going to uh, show you a short clip from one of America's finest contemporary philosophers. Uh, he provides some commentary on what happened in Alabama, and I think it just nails it spot on. When you chase away the people who are handling production of the tomatoes, who are getting them from the vine to the box, when you take these people from the market, you get pretty predictable effects and scary secondary effects as well. So, when we got rid of these people, Scott Beeson thought what was going to happen is unemployed Alabamians were going to go into the fields and start picking tomatoes. They were going to get paid good American wages, they were going to get taxed, all right, and nothing really distortionary was going to happen. Some Alabamians went out there and tried it. You want to know how long most of them lasted? 
not even about half a day. By noon, they actually were complaining that this work is oppressive and it's a violation of human rights. Okay? I swear to God, all right? So within half a day, people were saying, no way, all right? Uh, the farmer that we've uh, collaborated with on some of this also ran into a problem in that typical Alabamians in the labor market wanted to be paid differently than the way immigrants were paid. So the immigrants who were out there working illegally on contract work for a short period of the year wanted to be paid piecemeal. Do you all know what piecemeal pay is? Pay based on production. Number of boxes of tomatoes harvest, harvested was how they got paid. Alabamians who went out to the fields wanted to be paid by the hour. Now if you're paid hourly for production of tomatoes, how is that going to differ in terms of your output versus piecemeal? You have an incentive to shirk. You have an incentive to shirk. Okay, so if you're being paid by the hour, you just pick real slow, okay, and just kind of soak up the sun, which is really miserable, all right? Uh, piecemeal pay encourages you to produce really, really fast. So there was a very big difference in terms of production from those few people who actually went into the fields and tried to produce. Alabama, by the way, wasn't alone. Georgia also passed a bill that was about as perverse and had a really big effect on their market. We saw this firsthand in Alabama. We weren't able to get tomatoes at a number of restaurants. If we wanted tomatoes on sandwiches that typically had them, we had to pay more. And there was a short-term temporary distortion. Now we have tomatoes again, but they're probably not coming from Alabama harvesters. Okay, there's been some adjustment where we're importing tomatoes from elsewhere. All thanks to this bill. Uh, second argument, this is the one that uh, uh, probably is the one people really push back on the hardest. Um, I think it's overly exaggerated uh, if, you, uh, if you think about it a little bit. So the second argument is that if we have immigrants come, they're going to um, soak resources from our welfare state. So if immigrants come, they're going to use our public schools, they're going to use our public roads, they're going to use our health care system, and all of this is going to be very, very costly for Americans, okay? Because immigrants are paying taxes, right? So you've heard this one, I'm sure, okay? Uh, in fact, there isn't a tremendous amount of evidence that immigrants are a huge drain, okay? If you think about it, one thing that cuts against this is they don't want to be detected. We're talking about illegal immigrants. They don't want to be detected. So they're probably flying under the radar, using a lot of our public resources less than ordinary Americans. If you look at the data, the main users of welfare systems in America are Americans, okay? Americans are really good at using the welfare system to subsidize Americans, okay? And this is basically something that's pretty constant if you look at the data. Uh, and I think one other thing um, to talk about here is that to the extent that there is a problem, is the problem the immigrants or is the problem the handouts that we're providing people? Okay, so really the question to be asking is, isn't this a problem with an overly generous welfare state? Okay. I don't know how Florida's laws are. Uh, when it comes to riding a motorcycle, do you have to wear a helmet here? No. Under 21 you do, over 21 you have some choice, okay? Do you have to have insurance? You have to, okay, if you want to. So you have to have insurance. Helmet. All right, so we have some complicated laws here. There are states that you can just ride without a helmet, without insurance. I think that that's still a possibility, even in Wisconsin, where I'm from Michigan, close to home, you can ride without insurance and without a helmet. Often the argument for having people mandatorily wear helmets is that they're going to crash their motorcycles, they're going to bang their heads, and then we're all going to have to pay the bill for their irresponsibility. Now what's the messed up part of that? Is it that they're riding without a helmet, or is it the premise, we're going to have to all pay their bill? I think it's the, we're all going to have to pay their bill. I would say that's what's really screwed up about our system. I think the same thing's going on here. To the extent that immigrants are dependent on welfare, let's think about what we're doing on the welfare front, okay? Um, let's continue on. I can get through a few of these uh, in a hurry. I'm a little behind, but that's okay. Um, many people, if you get through these first couple of arguments, and you say, look, immigration has some benefits, they'll say, yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I, I favor immigration, but it needs to be a certain type of immigrant. 
We need immigrants with high skills, immigrants who've had a lot of science, a lot of training. We'll take immigrants who have PhDs, okay? Uh, Bill, Bill Gates, when he was at Microsoft still, was a huge fan of immigration. But it needed to be people who had a lot of software training. Why would Bill Gates be a fan of immigrants with a lot of software training? <laughs> they could go into Microsoft, be employable, and basically another country provided the education. Okay, what a great deal for Microsoft. This is not what I'm talking about. That's great if we want high-skilled immigrants to come. I'm glad that people are in favor of high-skilled immigrants coming. I wish that they would follow that logic and say, you know what, we could use a lot of different skills in America and we would be better off for it. Getting into this business and saying we need certain immigrants to come and not others is really a slippery slope and problematic. There are multiple problems with it. Who's going to decide who's good and who's not? All right? Think about the United States' track record of picking what is good and what's not. When the United States tries to determine which industries are going to be the leaders in the future, we fail miserably, okay? President Obama is not a very good venture capitalist. It's not his comparative advantage, okay? He's not someone who's really doing a great job of identifying the next sectors of the economy that are going to be hot. He's pouring lots of money into the green economy, and the rates of return on that have been abysmal, okay? Lots of businesses going belly up, Lots of favors and cronyism happening, and for really questionable returns on investment. In the area of immigration, do you really want your government saying, this is what a good immigrant is, this is what a not good immigrant is? I don't. They're not good at identifying good versus bad of just about anything. How are they going to determine who's skilled and who's not? So to just be picky about who we take in is really something I'm not comfortable leaving to the state. If I'm not comfortable leaving it to the state, I say, let's just open it up, okay? Uh, a few more. So myth, three, uh, myth two and four probably should be together. Um, myth four is that immigrants don't pay taxes, okay? And this is just not true. Um, anyone living off campus right now? Uh, a lot of good. I, was at a, I gave this talk earlier this week, and I said, who are the people living off campus? And no one raised their hands. Uh, okay, um, got some problems here. Let me imagine you live off campus. All of you who live off campus probably haven't paid a property tax that you've seen. You probably don't get a separate bill for your property taxes if you're renting, but you all are paying property taxes whether you like it or not. It's part of your rent, okay? The landowner's passing on significant amounts of your property, his property tax, to you all. Well, immigrants are living, okay, in America, often in trailer parks, often in rentals, often crammed together in pretty close quarters, and they're not paying any official tax, but they're paying taxes on property by indirectly through their landlord, okay? They're paying sales taxes. Florida has both an income and sales, don't, or no, no you're just a sales tax, tax. You're just a sales tax state. So they're collecting all kinds of money from immigrants thanks to the sales tax. There isn't even an income tax that they're dodging, okay? Um, they're paying income taxes in some states as well, right? Uh, so taxes are being paid by immigrants, and the estimated amount is somewhere between 125 and 175 billion per year. Think about the sequester. There's all this drama, all this drama right now over 85 billion per year. We'd at least have that problem solved for two months if we just kept embracing immigrants, all right? In this world where there's no money, where we're looking like under every rock for money, at least that's the rhetoric of Washington, okay? Uh, hey, there's some money. Let's take it, okay? Um, myth five. Money gets sucked out by immigrants. How many of you have had like a trade class, like a, an international economics class or a trade class, a few of you? This argument's a little difficult to understand, but I hope I can bring it down to a level that's quite clear. Um, when you buy things from abroad, okay, there's no such thing as like a big sucking sound where money goes away and then America's worse off for it. Um, in, the in the national macroeconomic statistics, there's something called the trade deficit that a lot of people worry about. It's the statistic that we should be worried about the least paying basically no attention to at all, okay? There's a similar argument when it comes to immigration that what's happening when we give money to illegal immigrants is they take that money 
and they send it out of the country, back to their families in Mexico, or back to their families in China, or wherever the illegal immigrant is coming from. And that this is somehow harming America because the money is leaving the system. Right? This is just nonsense. Okay? And here's one way I hope I can demonstrate how it's nonsense. Let's imagine that that money goes to Mexico and never comes back. I personally would say, great, there's less money in America. And if there's less money in America, we all would be slightly better as a result of that. Ever so slightly. If that money goes to Mexico and never comes back, it's basically like some kind of deflation that we've experienced in a tiny, tiny way. If we all took the cash out of our wallets right now, put it in a pile and burned it, anyone with cash remaining would be slightly better off. Do you all understand that? So if we all burn our cash, I don't think we should try it, all right? And especially since I have hardly any. I need a little bit <laughs> in case I get robbed on the way home, okay? Uh, if we take all of our cash, put it in a pile here, the United States experiences an ever so slight deflation in the money supply. And that deflation means anyone with currency remaining experiences an incremental increase in value. It's kind of a logical point, very basic. It's arithmetic, okay? If money goes to Mexico and never comes back, the value of our dollars goes up a tiny little bit. Now, I don't think money is going to go to Mexico and never come back. In fact, it'll come back into the country. We'll call this foreign direct investment. The Chinese buying bonds, the Chinese buying companies in America. And when they do that, I personally will say hallelujah. Okay? Thank you for buying things that are made in America. That's great. You're putting your money back to work in our economy. You think that it's worth betting on America. It's a, it's a closed system, and there's no such thing as a sucking sound. But people somehow say immigrants are just taking our money, and they're like moving it someplace outside of the world, like to Mars. They've moved the money to Mars. All right? It makes no sense. But it's something to distract from the fact that immigrants are actually a benefit. Uh, myth six. Just a few more to go. Um, Immigrants erode traditional values. <clears throat> all right. You all have probably heard this argument. It's one that people in Alabama make quite often. Alabamians are very proud of their heritage. Um, when you see people who are different than you, and they look different than you, they speak a different language than you, at first it's a little bit intimidating. If any of you have traveled abroad, you know how it feels when you're like the outsider. You go to uh, I've been to the Czech Republic a couple of summers. I've been to Botswana. I'm like this weird person who's like the outsider, and everyone's like, wow. He doesn't know a word of what I just said, OK? And that's intimidating. Um, when immigrants come, it's intimidating for those who are the majority, too. right? Uh, but they're not breaking down traditional values in the way that people want us to think. So one of the claims that's often made is if you bring in a lot of people from, say, Latin America, it's often made against uh, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. If you bring them in, they're going to so erode our culture that what makes America great won't be there anymore. Okay? I'm sure some of you have heard this. What makes America great is that there are some old Americans who are still here preserving the Constitution and protecting liberty. Something kind of like that. Uh, that's nonsense, okay? Um, in fact, Americans have been very good at eroding the thing that was great about America. We did most of that, okay? The greatest generation did a lot of that. Our generation is doing a lot of that. It has very little to do with immigrants. Remember, they're illegal. They can't even vote, all right? What's done most of the damage in America? The vote and the people that we elect and send off to Washington, D.C. The nanny state, which I completely uh, despise, the notion that someone can tell me how big of a big gulp to drink, okay? That someone in Alabama can tell me what days of the week I can have a beer, all right? Um, and if it can be a draft beer or a bottle beer, all right? They actually regulate whether I can have a draft or a bottle beer. I hate this, but we did it to ourselves. No immigrant did that to me. We did it to ourselves. Um, but there's this argument that there's lots of deviant moral values, really deviant behavior, that we're going to encounter if we just open the doors to immigrants. That's wrong. And there's actually some pretty good data on this that indicates that things like, what, what would you look for if you were looking for deviant behavior? One of the things I would look at is crime rates. 
we're actually much, much worse to each other than immigrants would be to us. So immigrants would actually improve the crime statistics if we let them come. All right? We're really bad on other Americans. American on American, American on American violence is what's driving a lot of the crime statistics. Marriage rates. Immigrants stay married a lot longer than Americans. So some indicator of a deviant moral value would be that um, you just go in and out of marriages real quickly. We do that. Lots of that, okay? Um, religiosity. If you think religion is some kind of proxy for good moral values, the immigrants coming are more religious than the Americans that are here, okay? So the things that you would look at for like a, a, a proxy for culture are actually really strong in the immigrants who would be coming. Uh, and in fact, if you're a little bit more open-minded, think of the great things that immigrants bring in some areas that we call the good life. Food, music, art, entertaining conversation, all right? Think of how stale life would be if the only people you were talking to were people that you've been around your entire life. If I go to my neighbor and I talk about, ah, what'd you do this weekend? Watch the Crimson Tide win again, okay? They win a lot, they win a lot, okay? <laughs> Think of how boring that is versus meeting someone from somewhere far away who isn't like you. That's a far richer experience to talk to someone who isn't like you, okay? I would say that's raising traditional values and raising culture if we can have more people like that. Uh, just a couple more. We can't have open borders because it's going to actually encourage terror, all right, and violence. The immigrants are going to come and they're going to plant the seeds to uh, the destruction of liberty. They're going to attack us. All right, this is one that I, I actually heard uh, this on the way down here today. I was listening to talk radio. It's good to like, you know, keep your ear to what other people are thinking. And one of the things they're thinking about immigration is that, so the Republican Party is having this real spiritual conversation right now. Should we be more open to immigrants? Marco Rubio is like the candidate of openness, perhaps, okay? So they're having this internal spiritual dialogue with themselves. And of course, Top Radio is talking about the spiritual dialogue. And one of the things that was being said today uh, was that, oh, we can't have uh, foreigners because they breed terror. Um, again, just nonsense, all right? You have to, like, just have a good nonsense detector, okay? That's just a completely outrageous claim. More integrated societies, I think, are actually a lot more peaceful. Um, people who work in the intelligence community have looked at what cities in America are among the safest. Here's some trivia. Anyone want to guess what major city in America is the safest, according to some recent intelligence research? Yeah. San Antonio, Texas? No, they're not integrated enough. Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. New York. <laughs> <laughs> go north. Go, go to Michigan. Uh, uh, Detroit. Oh, oh, Detroit. Who said Detroit? Detroit. No. Detroit is actually a really safe city. Let me pass that. <laughs> Detroit. Listen. Detroit's a safe city when it comes to a terrorist attack. Okay. Oh. Now, oh. <laughs> now, listen. What, what you might, what you might be saying is, well, Detroit's a safe city from a terrorist attack. Because why would you dare like try to attack Detroit? That's not, the, <laughs> that's not the causal story. It's that Detroit's actually a really integrated city with pockets from many different uh, countries of the world, uh, large populations who have settled there. And it's a place that terrorists would, would look at and say, I really don't need to attack it. So there's this idea in foreign policy, there's an idea in foreign policy that if people cross borders, you're less likely to attack those places that have people that are like you there. Okay, it's much like the trade argument, except it extends to people. Uh, if you think about 9-11, Every one of the people involved in 9-11 was here legally. So if we're going to use immigration policy, think about this. If we're going to use immigration policy to protect against terror. That's like a really blunt instrument. If someone wants to attack us and they're de determined to do so, they'll become legal and then do it. Okay? So why in the world would you use immigration policy to do it? How about strengthening the police force? Maybe reallocating some of the immigration resources to protecting people. If you're using immigration policy to do this, it suggests your law and order is really breaking down, okay? Uh, maybe there's a failure in defense 
uh, perhaps. It certainly shouldn't be addressed through immigration policy. Uh, I can talk more about that point in questions and answers, perhaps. Um, myth eight, we're wrapping up now. Immigrants are bad for America. Uh, none other than Alan Greenspan, um, back in 2007, is responsible for the statement here in this slide. We used to be a melting pot, but now seem to have some trouble with that. I think that's sad. Uh, Greenspan's really kind of interesting. He's become uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman who's blamed, in large part, for the financial crisis. He deserved some of that blame. He kept rates really, really low in the early 2000s. But he did have some pretty neat ideas about how to deal with the fact that we had a housing glut. Think about the housing market. We still have about a year's supply of housing. So if we just kept demanding housing at the same rate we have been, it would take a year to exhaust all of that supply that's on the market. A year of people buying houses at the rate they are, Nobody else build a home. Everyone stop building. It's still going to take us a year to clear out the supply. When you have an excess supply, it's going to be very depressing for prices, and it implies like a really screwed up market, right? You have a surplus. You all know from your principal's classes, you shouldn't have a massive surplus of your resource. So how could we get rid of a surplus? One way would be to just knock down communities, okay? Like Phoenix, Arizona has communities where no one's living in them. Okay? Phoenix has subdivisions where no one is living in the community. We could just burn them. Burn the community that has no one living in it. But that would be really wasteful, right? It'd be really, really wasteful to burn houses that actually have some value. A far better approach, perhaps, would be to buy immigration and housing together. Come to America, buy a house, we'll make you legal. Okay? In fact, this is an idea that uh, some Democrats have been behind. It's an idea that Alan Greenspan was very open to, but it has gone nowhere as actual policy. Okay? Um, seems like it would make sense. You're alleviating a housing problem, and you're giving people halves to citizenship in America. Instead, what we're doing is just a really crazy set of policies that are hard to make sense out of, that require expertise in the legal market, and that just um, arbitrarily pick people out of the country um, if you're unlucky, if you get picked up at the wrong time. So what should we do? This is my last uh, uh, slide here. What should we do? Uh, I think that first best, remember, we're basically at like 11th best. So I've got first best and second best. We're down at 11th best right now, okay? Uh, so we've got a long ways to go. I personally would love to see uh, the borders open and let people move around as they see fit. I think that openness in America is wonderful. The fact that I can move from Alabama, say, to Florida at a really low cost. There are some costs. I have to go to the DMV again, which is absolutely horrible, okay? But think about what people wanting to come to this country are doing. It's like the DMV for years and years and years of their life, okay? And at a tremendous cost. You need a lawyer who's like a mastermind, who can get you through the system. Think about what he's making on that deal. And he's making it again and again and again. It's a policy that rewards people who find like some really magical path to getting here. They found the password. That's not a system that's based on any kind of equality under the law. Not a system that I think any of us should be very proud of. Open borders is so, so far away as a possibility. But let's just remember that that's, I think, something that makes a lot of sense as the ideal. Second guess, how about maybe returning to 19th century policy? Just get a lot looser with it and say, if you don't have a major problem, if you can understand the instructions we're telling you, we'll let you in, okay? Uh, that's like dreaming as well, but it's a little less dreamful than just letting people come if they want to. Uh, or even something perhaps a little more radical. If citizenship is something that's so great, and we, people really want to come to America, which I think they do, how about just auctioning off rights to it? Instead of creating years and years of hassle and regulatory snakes, how about we just auction off the rights? You want to come to America? Here's the price of coming. Remember, we've got this budget problem. Okay, $85 billion, that's like this huge drama. There's some money for the government. Auction off rights to come into the country. More people will come. The US economy will gain from it. And we can deal with our $16 trillion debt in the process. All right? Again, that's dreaming. We're in 11th best. But it never hurts to dream. Okay, uh, that's 
all I have to say, other than I'm just going to wrap up with um, one of America's very best philosophers, uh, and I think that uh, uh, watching him hone in on what the fundamental problem is with the immigration policies that states are passing uh, will give you some sense of how screwed up states are in the direction that they're headed, and it's a, it's a really good indicator for um, uh, what not to do as a lawmaker. So um, one second, I'll see if I can get this up and uh, loaded, and that will be a thank you all for your attention, and give me just, uh, this is about four or five minutes, let me see if it'll go. <laughs> One of the best philosophers. Tomatoes. They're the most delicious food that you can throw at a crossing guard. I'm a big boy and I will cross where I want. Tomatoes and their East Coast variant tomatoes are also a key part of the classic American sandwich, the BLT. And I am not saying that because this show is underwritten by the BLT Council. But to be clear, the club sandwich is a lightly toasted, unholy three-way whose sinful triple-decker existence threatens the sanctity of traditional sandwich. <laughs> Read your Bible, folks. God ordained that lunch should be between two slices of bread, no exceptions. Leviticus 2018. And that is not the only threat to the American way of lunch, because thanks to illegals, our country's tomato industry is plum screwed. In the heart of tomato country, Hispanic workers and their families are walking off the job and leaving the state in fear. These farmers in Alabama say they're facing a crisis. Their fruits and vegetables are rotting in the fields because there aren't enough farm workers. Farmers are reportedly shorthanded because illegal immigrants have fled the state's toughest in the nation immigration laws. Yes, Hispanic farm workers have fled Alabama, stealing yet another thing Americans would like to do. <laughs> and all just because, just because the state passed Alabama. Alabama. Folks, and it's all just because the state passed an immigration bill that requires police to check papers during routine traffic stops and makes it a crime to knowingly transport, harbor, or rent property to illegal immigrants. Oh, boo-hoo, amigos. Grow a pair of whatever the Mexican word is for cojones. <laughs> all, all Alabama was trying to do was free up these farm jobs that Los Illegales are taking from Americans. But there has been a small hiccup in this otherwise flawless plan. Jim? We tried in different ways, you know. Try to like uh, get American people, you know, and uh, help right here, but I, they come one day and they quit. It's not that easy. They can't. Uh, they but, can't take the hours, and they and then honestly, they can't take the heat. The Americans aren't going to get out in the heat and work. They're not going to bend their back all day long, and they're not going to work, and they're not as hard workers as Hispanics. It turns out <laughs> different ethnicities have different innate gifts. Hispanics are good at hard labor. Asians are good at calculus, and Americans are good at generalizing about what other people are good at. <laughs> folks, folks, no one could have predicted this would happen, except me. <laughs> Last year, in my critically acclaimed testimony before Congress, I shared my vast one-day experience working as a <laughs> Really? really hard. <laughs> For one thing, when you're picking beans, you have to spend all day bending over. It turns out, and I did not know this, most soil is at ground level. <laughs> we can put a man on the moon, why can't we make the earth waist high? Come on, where is the funding? <laughs> this brief experience gave me some small understanding of why so few Americans are clamoring to begin an exciting career as seasonal migrant field worker. <laughs> now, I'm not the kind of guy who says, I told you so. I'm the kind of guy who makes it a banner. <laughs> out there are gloating that Alabama is just reaping what it sowed. Wrong, because there are no immigrants left to reap it. <laughs> Fortunately, Alabama has come up with a 21st century solution, chain gangs, because Alabama farmers are being offered inmates to help pick produce before it rots. Now, instead of having our food tainted by illegal aliens, 
it'll be harvested by perfectly legal criminals. <laughs> this plan worked perfectly in Georgia, other than the working part. Jim? Georgia's Agriculture Commissioner will tell Congress today his state's tough new immigration law has left farmers short 11,000 workers. And instead of jobless Americans, some of the new workers are prisoners and ex-cons who farmers say don't work as fast as immigrants. Don't have quite the same work ethic as Guatemalans who've walked through 500 miles of desert to feed their children. So, it appears that Alabama is in a bit of a bind. But Republican state rep Jeremy Oden knows who's to blame for the problem caused by his legislation. Jim? Look, we need a federal program, a migrant program, that we can apply in our state and get these skilled laborers to stay and help these people out. Yes, the federal government must fix this problem by sealing the state borders. I say deploy the FBI, the National Guard, the President's Council on Physical Fitness. Everybody, get them to Alabama to arrest whatever immigrants are left and throw their asses in jail. Then we can force them to pick up the Because to preserve, to preserve our precious BLTs, we must do whatever it takes other than offer these people any rights. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Questions? Um, that's, uh, <laughs> that's actually a really good indicator. Um, maybe one of the best proxies for states that are on the wrong track is Colbert or the Onion are commenting on something in your state. Do the opposite. <laughs> uh, I, I think that that's a lesson from that. Uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, mine's just a question about. Uh, so, I probably agree with you about open borders, but mm -hmm. I'm curious about what you mean by how would you statistically, statistically determine that they're more religious than people who are currently in the areas they're migrating to? I, 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 yeah. How did you come up with that? So, there, that's compared to American. Um, level. So most of the um, Latin American um, immigrants who are coming are strongly Catholic. Um, most uh, Indian Americans who are coming uh, have strong religious values. Most Middle Easterners have strong religious values. And if you think that religion is part of, um, you know, just having, you know, core values of integrity and honesty and, you know, just things like this, and if you step back from the idea that religions could cra clash, um, I would say that religiosity is telling you something about culture. And those, the values, certainly based on survey data of people who are coming, are more intense than what we were here. We've become a pretty secular nation. Uh, religi religiosity in the United States is declining, yeah. um, with the exception of just a couple of religions. The people who are coming are more unskilled, they're less educated. Uh, but they are very um, devout in most cases. Uh, it's an on average point. Okay, I, it, I just don't know how you would grade that on a, yeah. a scale. I, I don't. I, I'm not real sure how you measure culture. But if I were to start, I would say things like, you know, people's core convictions. You know, are, do you do you believe in absolutely nothing? Which might be fine. Right. Okay. Um, but it, you know, it, it's it's picking up something if you say that. Developed. And I think it, it's also mapping into marriage rates. Oh, okay. right. If you're good. really religious, you may be inclined to commit less crime. Yeah. So they're they're correlated with each other. It is a stew that we might call having strong culture. Yeah. How would they? How would you pay an income tax, whether it was state or federal? Uh, if you were an immigrant. An immigrant. Uh, well, if you're illegal, you're not. Um, you know, you're. You're basically flying under the radar. Um, I I think that if we're worried about the the issue of taxation, um, you know, here again, if you want everyone paying their equal share, or if you want people to come above ground, you need to give them a path to come above ground. But then you also have a problem in America of needing to give them an incentive to do so. Okay, so if taxes are going to be just awful on them, why come above ground? You know, so I think that there's somewhat of a bargain that would have to happen where tax rates may need to come down 
and in return, these people get a path to citizenship, so that they're paying some taxes, uh, but they are gaining something in terms of citizenship. Uh, as it stands now, um, you're you're not paying a lot of the income tax uh, taxes as an immigrant. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, great presentation, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you. Totally agree. We should have a, a policy that's as open and humane as possible. Um, but I also believe that if you work here, you should be paid an American wage, and that goes back to your first myth mm -hmm. about Chris and the illegal immigrant. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that the illegal immigrant, you could hypothetically pay 25 instead mm -hmm. of 75. Uh, my first question would be, why is the illegal immigrant willing to work for 25? And that was kind of a rhetorical question, because yeah. leaving him that uh, he's probably sending most of the money back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And you address that point by saying, um, that the money comes back in the form of foreign investments, mm -hmm. um, maybe, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Uh, if it's in dollars, the dollars eventually come back in some form. And if they don't, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Because, uh, because we're dealing with dollars being paid out. Right. Yeah. Because of deflation. And you, yep. and you favor deflation. Uh, still, though, you're at least for the short term, you're sending money out of the country. Chris is not getting paid. So even though you have $50 left over in your pocket to go out and eat with, that's $25 that has essentially been taken out of the economy. Or at least some part of it has. Okay. And sent back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's been taken out of the local economy at least. Sure. Uh, so I don't know. I, I kind of feel like that's a negative. Okay. And even if you, know, you have the deflation, which you feel is a good thing, I personally don't because we have a lot of debt in this country and inflation increases the value of debt. Um, which we're obsessed with paying down. I don't know, like, I want, I want immigrants to work here, but I think when an immigrant works here, it should be paid the minimum wage, whatever it is. Okay. And I don't think a guy is going to mow an acre for $25 yeah. if he can get paid $9 an hour somewhere else, hopefully, yeah. is what it will be. And I think you see where yeah. I'm coming from. I, I do, um, and there's a lot in your statement. So um, the, the thing to focus on, I think, is the notion that paying someone less is going to be damaging to the economy. So the, the gains that are left over from me paying someone 25 instead of 75 go into completely unseen, unanticipated new lines of production. So there's going to be demand higher somewhere else in the economy. And if we were to focus on keeping that wage at $75 for a person, um, we would lose out on all of that dynamic stuff that you can't see, all of the creation of jobs and uh, of new resources there. It, it, it's the unseen. Uh, I think that the best place to look in terms of understanding this dynamic is to look at the time from and look at what's happening with jobs and okay, So you're protecting workers there for the sake of American ways of life and for high wages and maybe for some local economic gain. Uh, but it's led to stagnancy in the industry. It's led to our auto industry falling behind in terms of the quality of cars they're putting out. Uh, and I think it's really held America back. What should have happened is we should have had a dynamic auto industry, one that was entrepreneurial enough to say there's right to work labor in the South. We should be in that market. We shouldn't have, you know, if you're if you're worried about who's doing the producing, it shouldn't have been Toyota and Hyundai and Kia in the South. It should have been the American companies, but they're so uh, uh, strangled by union laws and by where they can locate uh, and how much they can produce that it ended up being foreign competition instead. All of that is stuff that could have happened had we had the more dynamic uh, uh, world that I'm imagining when it comes to labor exchanges and finding the cheapest producer of labor that's identical. Remember that the $25 is identical production. He's cutting the same grass, it's identical production, it's just cheaper. And I have no idea if that's a fair wage or not, uh, but it's one that he's willingly contracted into, so I, I, I'm saying it's fair just based on that criteria. Okay, the only, uh, I don't want to vote yeah. out the conversation. No, that's fine. I'll just be quiet after this, but it, your, your model seems to assume that Chris is not spending $75 that you pay him. When you're talking about all the externalities. Oh, he can, he can spend it. Uh, it's, it it's, it's an efficiency point. I wish I could draw it. Um, if we embrace and keep Chris in the $75 job, 
there are tremendous deadweight losses uh, for the economy. And it's, it's an economic term. It's just it's exchanges that won't happen. The pie doesn't get bigger if we protect Chris. The pie grows uh, in a world where we allow the cheapest labor to be hired for the job. Okay. Well, I promise you. Thank you. I, and I promise that that's a true economic point. Um, yeah. I was wondering, um, on your earlier, I don't know if it was like the fourth one or yep. not, um, you were talking about immigrants and the welfare state. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, I don't know if like, the argument is different than what you were talking about. Like, in yours, you were talking about how people say that illegal immigrants use the welfare state. Mm -hmm. And I thought the premise was that they, if we make them legal, then they're just going to come right on to the yeah. So I was wondering yeah. if was that. So, so it could be both. So in California, um, there's some talk of legalizing illegal immigrants, normalizing, making in one fell swoop about 11 million immigrants legal, okay? And you know why this is happening, by the way. It's, um, just, it's, it's a very democratic move, okay? If we make these people legal, um, they'll all vote for the person who made them legal. And it's, I would say, a major problem with democracy <laughs> uh, in that you know, you're, you're just playing a political game with a group that currently can't vote. Um, so if all of those people indeed come into the market and become legal and then draw on the system because they're entitled to it, I would say that's a big problem with the system. Uh, just as it is a problem when we expand Medicaid and allow more people to be eligible for Medicaid or anything else, if suddenly by adding groups you're saying Americans are going to be bankrupted, that's the problem not with the adding of groups, it's the problem with what you're offering in the way of benefits. Um, so the, so I, the topic of open, of, excuse me, of open borders then is yeah. contingent upon fixing others. Yeah, limiting the welfare state. Yeah, so I mean, it's, 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 a, it's something that's going to require um, possibly a number of get serious conversations. Let's get serious about democracy, let's get serious about the welfare state, let's get serious about immigration. And, and all of those things have to kind of happen simultaneously. If, if we don't fix the welfare state and we just say a lot of people have rights to citizenship, then the welfare state collapses from all of the demands on it. Which maybe some of you, I know I've talked to a few of you and you're like, yeah, let's have that happen. Um, I'm a little scared about that, but you can imagine that that's indeed what would happen. If you're guaranteeing people who are low income all the same benefits now that they're citizens as we're guaranteeing current Americans, it'll collapse like that. So you need to fix that simultaneously with some of these other things. Um, yes. Sure. Uh, I was just wondering if you have any examples of like countries who have open borders, just because I never hear it as an actual yeah. like, possibility, or if it's just kind of like, so, oh, this would be cool if this ever happened, but no one ever does it because it yeah. has a lot of like implications in public policy. Yeah, so there are countries that turn a pretty blind eye to whoever comes, you know, and you can't get full-fledged citizenship there, but you can come and leave pretty freely. I think that the best examples we have of the openness I'm imagining are at the integrated national or large union level. So to be able to move around Europe pretty freely is an example of free movement and mobility in the direction that I'd like to see more of. To be able to move around the United States freely is an example of really successful mobility. So why not scale that up? Why not allow people to move between the United States and Mexico? Or why not just have an open, open world to a much more significant extent? So just to go off that, yeah. don't you think that, that free movement might have to do something with like cohesion of currency? The fact mm -hmm. that the European Union allowed them to use the same currency in the United States, we, like yeah. Alabama doesn't have a different dollar than Florida is, yeah. um, that we wouldn't have to do things like that. Um, yeah. Would you then recommend sort of a currency for the entire world? So no. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that uh, the European Union could work just fine with lots of currencies. I think the United States was working just fine with um, state charter currencies, uh, and we'd be fine. I, I think that the argument that that's holding it all together um, is denying um, just the fact that it's people who are holding it together. Um, one more thing on the open border point, cities are really um, where to look for successful open borders. So Manhattan. Um, has lots and lots of illegal immigrants that as long as you stay out of trouble, they'll let you stay there essentially. London, uh, very similar. And it's working. They're working in jobs. They're willingly being hired by people who are willing to take the risk on them. They're gaining. The people hiring them are gaining. And we aren't having a bunch of terror from them. We aren't having you know all of these other 
really scary things in Manhattan and London are really great cities. And they're not decaying because of the illegal immigrants. If they're decaying, it's because um, of Michael Bloomberg. <laughs> a lot more than the immigrants. Um, um, I know that you said this was not exactly the best solution, mm -hmm. but when you said that it's creating a market for citizenship and it's selling it to yeah. people, I have a few issues with that. Sure. First, that you are creating an elitist system where only the people who already have money are able to get in. Um, second, that seems to me like that goes against your earlier point that you know there should be a barrier. You know, so mm -hmm. these people would have. To have a higher education level and order to have the skills to get the jobs to pay this you know, barrier to entry. Yeah, so remember, it was second best. Yeah. Okay, so right now we're in a world where it's still the elitists who are getting in, either because they have the high skills that make it easier for them to come, or because they have the savvy to hire the right lawyers to get in and then become legal. So it's, it's very much biased in, uh, in the direction of elitists now. What making a market for citizenship, which is far inferior to just saying let's let people come, what making a market to citizenship would allow is for all of that red tape and the tremendous costs people are having to invest right now in terms of time, energy, legal fees um, into becoming a citizen. A lot of that goes away in favor of just paying some money. Okay, so uh, it's an efficiency point, and I I'm an economist. I think that um, the efficient thing in ways would be right. The bigger problem I have with it is you're acknowledging that citizenship, in some sense, is something that we should be rationing. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm a fan of that. Um, yeah? Have you ever looked at how much the government actually spends on enforcing immigration laws and thought about doing like a um, cost-benefit analysis of like potential revenue we can get? Yeah. <clears throat> I haven't. Um, I think that there are projects that should be done in this area. It's possible that there are some really good people doing work on immigration. This project for me um, was spawned completely out of what they're doing at the state level and the fact that our centers in the state, we wanted to just get it. Uh, so I'm just, I'm pulling from literature and I'm, I'm not even like the expert in this area. There are really good academics who may have done that. Um, if they haven't, it, it sure would make sense. And I think that the savings uh, would be tremendous, just as we've found with free trade, that if we were to allow for more free trade, the gains to world growth <coughs> could be just enormous. The gains to world growth, if we were to just get a lot of the barriers out of the way to becoming a citizen, um, could be huge, I suspect. They certainly were huge for America uh, during our last wave of immigration prior to World War I. Yeah. So you're a... Uh your point about the uh, Albanians who went to the fields to mm -hmm. take the, the, those occupations. Do you know how many actually uh, tried to do this? Do you have specific numbers? I, I don't. It wasn't a very long-lasting experiment. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's hot, it's miserable, and uh, um, there were some legal um, immigrants who were doing some of the producing, but the the consensus was it was a disaster. The, one of the quotes that we have from uh, our farmer friend who contributed to this research was, uh, most tomato farmers <coughs> right now uh, just want to go march on, march on Montgomery and find the people responsible for this. And I mean, they were just really, really uh, frustrated. There's really an interesting um, story of learning embedded in this research, mm -hmm. too. So remember I told you, our farmer thought that, hey, it's a great idea. We got to do something about these illegal immigrants. And, the other big industry that we didn't focus on was construction. There's a lot of illegal immigrant uh, employment in construction. That's another one that we could have told a story about. We focused on tomatoes uh, because we had this farmer um, and because it also affected Georgia. Uh, but his initial attitude and political value was we got to do something about the illegals. And he did a 180 on it as soon as he saw what it meant to his farm, which is you know, maybe what we need with some of our um, you know, other policies in the world, we might need to actually be hit with them directly to, to realize the damage they're doing to us. The reason why I ask is that I, I, I'm inclined to think that maybe also their socioeconomic status might be a reason why they don't stay. So it could also be the fact that maybe there are better alternatives for them. That's why they don't take up these jobs, because you're right, they're really uh, uh, physically uh, uh, enduring, like it takes a lot to do them. Yeah. So that might be the case that they don't take them because there are easier alternatives to, um, to, 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 to take up that, you know, 
yeah. legal immigrants would be able to because of certain yeah. so the, barriers. The, the consensus uh, among people who looked at the problem, there were, there were towns that were very illegal immigrant friendly, even restaurants that were catering to them. And it just, they've become ghost towns. You know, parts of towns that there just is no one there anymore. And I suspect what happened is people just moved to a state that was slightly more immigrant friendly. I can't tell you just how screwed up this immigrant bill, um, the immigration bill is. You know, that, that quote from Colbert uh, about people being able to randomly be pulled over and have them have their papers, you know, they have to have their papers and have to prove that they're here legitimately um, was so bad that uh, that one of the things that happened is we have a Mercedes-Benz um, uh, plant just outside of the Montgomery area, I believe. Mercedes has German executives over here all the time, okay, because it's Mercedes. And uh, one night, one of these executives was driving uh, back to his hotel after dinner and got pulled over, didn't have his papers with him. The Economist magazine picked this up, by the way, and uh, got thrown in jail that night. And uh, uh, this is not good. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of being a job creator, imagine what that guy said when he went back home about this plant in Alabama. Like, don't ever send me back to that state again, okay? And if they're doing that to executives from Mercedes, uh, think about what they're doing to someone who doesn't even look like you. Um, and of course, the illegals caught on to this and just said, we're out of here, and got out of the state real fast. Yes. Um. I'm pretty sure this is like a kind of a common question in terms of the open border policy. Um, but uh, like, what what is the general response um, when one uh, brings up the worry of allowing uh, immigrants who committed past legal transgressions, specifically violent transgressions, into the country? Yeah. Well, uh, we we don't want to um, profile per se, um, and I don't think that that's the uh, direction that we would that I would be um, excited about. I think that, you know, you, um, there, there are messy issues in, when it comes to some of these things about who might come and how do you deal with the fact that there could be people who are fleeing a country who are criminals, who are just coming for a, uh, for a new start. We have ways of dealing with that now. You know, when a criminal commits a crime in uh, uh, one country, they can get extradited back uh, from another country. I think we could imagine that. Of course, it would require a major beacon up of resources committed to that. Um, I think that uh, uh, also, though, you know, you may want to just say for a lot of those crimes, this is your shot. We're going to hold you accountable under our rules, and they'll be enforced. If you stay out of trouble, you can stay here. Um, quite often, the people who are coming are refugees trying to get out, out of really bad situations. And they may be called criminals when, in fact, they're anything but. Um, so uh, in uh, a number of African countries, um, they're running from an oppressive government that's calling them a criminal. And all the crime is that they've committed is they've spoken out against a really bad dictator. So we have to be very careful there, too, about the notion of crime. But yeah, so someone who's committed a really bad crime, hopefully, could just, you know, it, even in an ideal world today, get sent back home and punished for the crime they've committed. Of course, the system doesn't work perfectly. Um, there's you know, movie stars who are in other countries than where they should be, and if they ever go home, they're going to get thrown into a whack job who's like in France or somewhere. Yeah. Uh, do you have any specific insights to share regarding uh, the current immigration situation in Europe? With respect to what? Uh, just immigration to uh, the European Union from uh, Western countries. My sense is that it's pretty difficult, uh, and my suspicion is that as the European Union continues to have countries with unemployment in the teens, that they'll become increasingly xenophobic, uh, especially xenophobic being pure foreigners, they'll really tighten down on labor market competition. So uh, in Italy, in Greece, in these countries that are really in decline, even in France, I mean, we have unemployment rates that are in the high teens in a lot of these countries. Do you really want, remember what I said, I don't want competition as a professor. The Europeans are saying, we don't want competition. When in fact, one of the things that should really help Europe right now would be a productivity shock. They could really use greater productivity. How could you get that? Maybe from an immigrant pool that comes in and provides things a lot more cheaply. It's really kind of odd, but one of the few sparks that could really help some of these European countries are more people. Um, 
J Japan has been in decay for about 25 years. Japan, one of its problems is they could use more people. Uh, they, and they're not going to reproduce their way out of it. You would really actually need some foreigners. Yeah, most of Europe and Japan are all at a 2.1 to 2.1 rate. Italy's Italy's really bad uh, in terms of reproduction rates. Yeah, so they're only about they don't have a But what about the like, cultural factors that we like put in cultural values that people can stay here in the Middle East? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that you you have issues there, you know, and I think that. <clears throat> when you're talking about culture, one thing we want to be careful of is that um, a lot of what is culture is actually nationalism, and that's uh, something very different than culture. You know, um, I I have Czech friends who worry about uh, the immigration of Germans a lot because the Czechs are very proud about their beer. Okay, and if you just let enough Germans come into the Czech Republic. They could buy up the beer makers. They could ger they could Germanize the beer. Okay, and this is like a very big concern as far as what it means for Czech culture. Uh, how do you respond to that in any kind of market where there's a higher willingness to pay from one group than another? You kind of say, well, if that other group values it enough, there'll be pockets of it. You know, I li I like uh, microbrews. I'm amazed that I can find some microbrews on um, part of the shelf. Is the shelf overwhelmed with Budweiser? Yeah, okay, but there's like this little pocket down here that has some microbrews in it. And that's thanks to the fact that there's some taste for difference and diversity. So the mix is gonna change. The mix is gonna change when it comes to culture and new people moving in. But I think there'll still be some things preserved if preservation is what's valued. If you like microbreweries, you should go to a proof while you're in Tallahassee. Proof. Well, I have to drive back tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it may be like one week. Yeah, you, you yeah. can stop by for one week. Yeah. It's sort of on that movie. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I think you categorize three things that we need to get serious about. Yeah. Yeah. Time longer, yeah. 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 So, um, the, the things that, if, if you're going to have, if you're going to have open borders, and you're going to have open, uh, if you're going to have open borders and if you're going to have immigration, you have to get serious about immigration, you have to get serious about the welfare state, democracy, and your laws. Okay, so how are you going to deal with the rule of law when you have people who are different coming? And how are you going to deal with defense and the administration of basic things like policing people? So it's, it's four, I guess. Okay, and my question is, would you also... Uh, I mean, I would presume you would also attack <coughs> drug policy for that? Is, would you look at Mexico? Um, is drug policy really? Well, I, it, it, I think it's a totally separate, well, it's not totally separate, but I mean, drug policy is causing, U.S. drug policy is causing so many problems in Mexico and in Guatemala uh, and then throughout South America as well. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, U.S drug policy could really help in uh, making those countries, in, in fact, here's the weird thing, U.S. drug policy, if it were to just relax, would make those countries more attractive to live in. Uh, we're really screwing up those countries and causing people to say, I gotta get out of here, it's violent, it's crazy, the country's being run by cartels. So if we could open up, I, I'm, it's a totally different argument, but I actually think that a lot more drugs could be legal. Um, I. Uh, you know, I, I don't see the harm in this for similar reasons. Um, people just willingly exchanging with each other as long as they're adults. Um, and I think it could really help on the immigration front. It's, it's one that I wouldn't put up there as this has to change too, but maybe it does. Yeah. Okay. The one more question caused all hands to go down. Yeah. They must not be good questions. <laughs> Everyone's scared of that last question. They want it to be good. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious, because Portugal tried to, I think they were actually into legalization for all drugs. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you were aware of any statistics about what the effects of those have been. Uh, so the, I mean, they've gone the rehabilitative route. Uh, they've decriminalized drugs. And from what I understand, it's uh, it's been a really big savings for law enforcement. Um, the predicted effect of, you know, some people are going to use heavily, uh, but some people are going to use heavily when they're illegal. Uh, they're really focusing on treatment, and I think that uh, uh, the, the results we're seeing there, that it's, 
uh, in my opinion, a much better approach than what we're doing in terms of just trying to enforce and create more problems than we're solving. Uh, at, the, uh, at the state level here in the United States, some of these very small state level experiments are causes for just a little bit of optimism in terms of people realizing that the sky doesn't fall when you just open up a, a state to marijuana. Now, will the federal government actually stop those experiments? It's quite possible. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a, a showdown there at some point. Thank you all. Uh, <laughs>